Good afternoon. You do realise it's not the original session that was meant to be in here, right? So you want to see Star Wars shit, yeah? Okay. Um, let me just close that door. There we go. All right. So um, it's kind of a bit of last minute, but I'm pretty happy I'm here to do this talk because I was kind of pushing for it. Because this is something that is really close to my heart, and I think that especially developers need. And we'll get into what it is that you need, but bear with me. Um, it's probably taken me six, seven years to write this talk. It's a talk that's sort of been mulling even before I started doing public speaking. It's something I needed to share, I needed to get out. This is also not a tech talk. So if you expect to see code, if you expect to see, you know, Darth Vader running off across the screen, it's not what's going to happen. Um, so, as I said, about six years ago, my life kind of changed. And it changed in a pretty dramatic way. Um, but before we get to that, I got a few questions for you first. So this is a conversation, right? I want to talk to you guys. I'm not here to talk at you. I'm here to talk with you. Because, see, I've already scared people away. <laughs> this happens. This, some of you might not like what I'm going to say, and that's fine. You can disagree, you can walk out, uh, that's fine. Um, you're lost, really. So first of all, are you satisfied? And I mean, are you satisfied with where you're at in life? Are you satisfied with what you're doing right now? Are you satisfied with where you're headed? Are you satisfied with the way that your life is shaping? Satisfaction is a core human emotion, right? It's something that we strive for. But at the same time, are you empowered to do what you want to do? Are you empowered to chase this satisfaction? Have you got the empowerment that you need from family, friends, colleagues, whoever, to actually pursue this, right? And I know this is all a bit airy-fairy because we like to work with bits and bytes, right? And that's why I'm doing this, because most of us will never, ever consider this. Are you leading? Are you actually leading the life that you want? Are you actually taking charge? There's a few nods here. That's excellent. Let's see at the end of the session, all right? <laughs> I'll challenge you a bit. I'll, I'll kind of get a bit annoying, to be honest. Um, but these are really important questions. If you've never asked yourself those, perhaps now is the time. Okay? Now, who here has a family? Exactly right. We all have family. And I cannot stress enough that family is the most important thing in your life. Family comes first. There are moments where I forget, granted, yes, it does happen, especially when you do a trip like this, right? Especially when you're wearing a HoloLens. Um, but family comes first. Family is the most important thing, and it's all of the stuff that I want to share and kind of tell you is all with family in mind, all right? Anyone have ambition? See, there's like three people, five people, right? That should be the same as has you got family, right? Ambition is what drives you in life. You might not know this, but ambition is the key to move forward, right? And I'm sorry, there is no stagnant state. You either move forward or you move backwards. That is, in my experience, that's, there's only two directions. You cannot stand still. And who wants more? Yeah, well, come on, Really? Everybody should be wanting more. I don't care what more is, right? It could be more time. It could be more time on your horse. It could be more friends. It could be whatever it is. You've got to strive for more. Right? I know this kind of, oh, that's very capitalistic of you. It's all about money. No, it's not all about money. It could be more time with your kids. It could, you, if you think you're content where you are, I'm sorry, but you're so, you know, very mistaken. Um, now, I wrote this talk. I gave this talk first time about six months ago. And just before that, I had a, what do we call him, Twitter friend? A guy I've never met in real life, but I know him through Twitter. You have people like that? Or social media? You know, Snapchat? I'm a bit old for Snapchat, I've been told. Um, but this guy tweeted this. Need a new job, getting desperate now. And I've obscured his name because I don't want to kind of ask him, right? 
But I don't think he was asking for a new job. It's a cry for help. It's something else that's going on because changing a job is easy. You might not like it, but it's easy. Getting a new job, especially as a nerd, is not hard, right? There's plenty of jobs around. So I kind of reached out to him and said, hey, what's up? And it turned out that he was actually not, sat, he was not happy with the direction he was going. He had dreams and wishes and, and thoughts about how his life should have been, but it wasn't. And this is how he kind of told me. All right? But he's not alone. Like, they're all over. This was one search on Twitter back in July or August. Look at that guy. I'm ready to die. I'm ready to die. Holy shit. Right? You share that on Twitter. I bet you he hasn't told his parents. Um, or her, sorry. But we're not, like, these thoughts and these feelings and all this, you know, stuff that we don't talk about. It comes out like that, and we all have them. It is, it's part of everybody that we need an outlet. We, we want change. We want to move forward. We might tell ourselves that we don't for a bit, but you will. You will want to move forward. And it might come in, you know, I don't know how your journey is going to pan out, but you can actually take charge of it. Now, why am I here telling you all this, right? So I don't want to boast about, oh, look at me, I'm on stage, right? But to put a bit of context around this, this is me today. So I run Crazy Dane Software. I made that logo, by the way. <laughs> like it? So I'm the graphic designer. I'm the chief architect. I'm the director. I'm the coffee lady. It's just me, right? I'm a freelancer. That's what I do. But I choose to do that. It's a choice. It's a very conscious choice, so I can choose exactly what I want to do. I help out creating an event in Melbourne, that's where I live, kind of, called Developer, Developer, Developer. I believe you have them in, in, uh, in the UK as well. Is that right, DDD? Yeah? Cool. Excellent. Fantastic event. I love it. I've been doing it for seven years now. We're going to do number eight next year. We're going to change everything. It's awesome. I do Pluralsight courses. So there's a bunch of Pluralsight authors at the conference, speaking and not speaking. And the content that we create, I'm really proud of. It is by far the best platform for technical learning, in my opinion. And I get to be part of it. And it wasn't by chance. I made a conscious decision again to, hey, I want to produce courses for that, right? I'm a Microsoft MVP. It means I don't work for Microsoft, but they give me stickers. You know? They wanted me to put them on here. I don't do stickers, but oh well. What it also does is that it gives you a foot in the door, especially when you're a freelancer, because I got to chase jobs all the time, right? I got to chase all the leads because no one else is going to give me work but me. Having that sticker or that little title means that people go, oh, even though they actually don't know what it means, but they've heard of it and say, he probably knows what he's talking about. Um, I'm part of what's called Guru IO, Guru status. Sounds very important, doesn't it? It's actually a job searching platform. <laughs> but I write for them and I help them build it up to something. And from that, since I did this talk last time, I'm actually taking on mentoring as well. So I've got a mentoring out of my business because I like sharing people and, you know, I don't, I'm not very nice, <laughs> which is why it works, okay? I, uh, Lenovo Insider, I'm a Lenovo Insider, which is kind of a th way of Lenovo saying, hey, you talk about stuff, if you talk about stuff and use our product, would that be cool? And they give you devices. Right? But it's not like I'm saying, hey, Lenovo's the best, woo! If you read my review of this machine, I'll say it's really good, but, you know. So it's a way of, again, choosing an avenue that's kind of fits with my persona. I write for a site called SitePoint in Melbourne, and I'm in the process of writing a book for Sync Fusion, and it's, it's going to be done three weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, that's still in progress. Um, but I'm not just all work, right? I'm a member of three car clubs, Jeep Melbourne, Melbourne Jeep Owners Club, the BMW Car Club Victoria, and Vanilla Auto Club, which is like a speedway type thing, right? I like cars. I love cars. Um, Many, many, many people pay me out because I like older cars. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you like going to a shed and find rust. <laughs> um, I run a B&B &B in Victoria, in, in Australia, a bed and breakfast. And we have a used car business as well. 
So I don't, I don't sit around, okay? And I do all this because of what, everything I'm going to tell you in this talk. Right, I kind of want to push you. I'm not saying do all this. If you don't want to do it, well, why should you? But I want to kind of show to you that you don't have to be 9 to 5. Right? Oh, yeah, this dude. I cloned. <laughs> I think it's a, there's nothing of his mother in him. I cannot run away from this. One. I have no idea what he's doing. But um, this is the most important thing in my life, despite everything else I do, right? This little boy is, like, I'm his whole world. So that is, you know, it's paramount that whatever I do is some way related to his benefit. And I'm sure you feel the same way if you've got kids. And I do get to live here, which is kind of cool, right? So that's our property, down to about there. And there's the house. We've got some containers full of cars. Um, and we've got some fields and stuff. I love where I live, and I've chosen it. It's a very conscious decision to go and live in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I have a very interesting talk on Australian internet. Hmm. Um, so that's me. But I actually want to start at the beginning. And... When I say beginning, I don't mean when I was born, right? Because that's pretty boring. I don't remember anyway. I want to talk about about six years ago, seven years ago, when my life completely changed, like 100%, 180 degrees, however you want to say it. Um, I thought I had a maid, right? I went to uni. I did really well at uni because I'm a nerd. I did really well. Top of the class, got medals and stuff and shit, right? Whew! All right, got an awesome job. I got a house. I had a house that was overlooking National Park, had big windows, big block of land on top of a hill. Um, I had a job. We all got a job, but I had the job, right? I actually got to look at car data all day. My test data was cars. It was perfect. It was, you know, just made in heaven. I had the car. I had the big Aussie V8. All right, the thing that, you know, if you worry about fuel economy, you don't buy that car, okay? I chose to have that car. I looked out for it. I chose it. It was the right color, black leather. It was, I had the car. Say again? Oh, shut up. <laughs> it's a Calais. VE Calais VV8. Lots of Vs. Uh, apparently, if you've ever been to Calais, no one there understands why the hell you would name a car after that sound. <laughs> um, but I thought I had a maid, right? I had everything. Society dictates this is what you need, right? My parents always told me, hey, you go to school, you do really well at school, then you go to uni, you do really well at uni, you get a job, and then you get a house, and you get a better job, and you get a better house, and then you get a better job, and you probably get a wife. I had a wife as well. But what really was happening was kind of like this. This wasn't me, Right? I was doing everything that society was telling me that I had to do. Everything. I was doing well. I was, you know, going up in the grades, whatever. But it was just all a bit of a front. It was just not me. I was not being true to what I actually wanted. I even had that view from the office. That's not my office, right? I wasn't the manager. But the view from the office in Melbourne. But ever since I was a kid, I had this little flame. So I was the guy at school. You probably know this, the same guy if you weren't the same one. or girl. That if someone said, hey, who wants to do blah? And you went, hey, me, pick me, right? I always wanted to do the thing. I always wanted to explore. I always wanted to try the next thing. You know, and often I got, you know, not beaten up for it, but close. Because I was the nerd. Why would you, hey, no, don't, the teacher likes you, what? But that was me. And I had this little flame and it was always there. And I kept kind of, you know, fanning it and making it bigger and what. But I got a job, and it died, because I was no longer in charge. Society was in charge. They were telling me, you've got to do this. You've got to get a, you know, a job, whatever. And then something else happened. There's something called a catalyst. You all, all have one of these or more in your life. There will be a catalyst moment in your life. For me, I found out my wife was cheating on me. That was hard. That was the darkest moment I've ever had. What the hell do you do? I had about a year. I didn't know what I was doing. I was fumbling around. I was living in this house. I, was, I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea. 
But I found that little flame, right? That little flame came back in the midst of all the chaos. And I'm not going to lie to you. Holy shit, it was scary. There were moments where I had no idea. I didn't know what I was doing. Because everything that society told me was going to happen, society didn't, right? I did everything, I did everything right and it still went to shit. Oh, sorry, I'll get rid of that guy. Is that better? <laughs> so it's not easy, right? And there are moments where you go, oh, I'm not even good enough. What the hell am I going to do? Because I had all these ideas, I had plans, I wanted to do this and that and the other. But I'm like, where do we even start? I don't know. Like, I didn't come up one day and say, oh, I'm going to speak at NDC London. That's what I'm going to do. No, I didn't know. I didn't even know that public speaking was what I was really passionate about. So what do you do? Luckily, I did meet someone in my life that kind of kicked me into gear. Um, I happened to live with her, and that's the mother of that boy you saw before. And she, learned, she taught me about goals, goal setting. So does anyone here set goals? Cool, that's good, yeah. Does anyone want to share a goal? You don't have to. I'm not going to you know, point out anything. Yeah, Chris? Keynote build. Say again? Keynote at build. Keynote at build, okay, right. So is that a goal or is that a dream? It's a goal. It's a goal, okay. So when's it going to happen? You say five years. No. When is it going to happen? See what I'm getting at? In five years. That's right. How are you going to do it? See, that's, I'm not having a go at Christmas because it's pretty brave that he actually put his hand up, right? But my point is that what you're describing right now is a wish, right? It sounds like a goal, but the fact you get, oh, five years. To me, that says, oh, hang on. Have you thought this through? So I have something that I want to share, which I use, which is called SMART Goals. And I know it's a stupid acronym for it, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's the best way to remember it. Um, so SMART Goals are a way of getting goals that you say, I want to keynote a bill, because I think that's an awesome goal. Don't get me wrong. One of mine is I want to do a keynote at TED in 2018. Not a keynote, sorry, a talk at TED. I'll, I'll settle for TEDx to start with, but I want to end up at TED, right? And the SMART goals is part of the way of getting there. So they've got to be specific. The more specific you can be, the more chances are that they're actually going to be real. If you can see them, well, you know what you're working towards. Specific specificity. Whew. That's a hard word in a second language. Um, they've got to be measurable. If you can't measure it, how do you know you're staying on track? How do you know that from two years from now? I'm sorry, I don't want to keep picking on you, Christmas, but it was a, it was a good example. <laughs> how do you know if two years from now that you are only three years away? Do you know what I mean? You've got to have these measurable milestones, targets, whatever you want to call them, mini goals. I don't know. Call them what you want. But you have to be able to say, hey, I've done progress or I haven't. Because otherwise, again, it's just a wish. It's a dream. They've got to be attainable, right? You, you, can, you can obtain anything you want, but you've got to make sure you can get there. You've got to have small goals, large goals, but in the end, you grow with the size of the goals, right? So don't make them too small either. Because if I had a goal, say, I want to speak at NDC London next year, right? Uh, but I'm already, yeah, nah, right? It's not really a goal because it's, that's too easy. That's kind of like, ooh, I did well. Um, so they've got to be big enough for you to... There's got to be a challenge in it. They've got to be relevant. Right? It, it doesn't help if I said, oh, I want to be an astronaut. It's not relevant. I'm never going to be an astronaut. Right? I'm old, I'm a geek, I'm fat. You know, it's not going to work. So they've got to be relevant to what you are, who you are and what you want to do. Relevance is key in terms of uh, bringing motivation to reach these goals. And then what Christus did do was time-bound. There's got to be a time on it. There has to be a time on these goals. Because if you don't have a time, what happens? No? Anyone? Don't be a Finnish audience, please. You may Exactly, right? You probably won't reach it. Because what happens? I'll do it next month. Yeah. Oh, no. You know what? 
my leg really hurts, I'll do it next month. Uh, you've got to have a goal. There's nothing to say that you can't change the date. Of course you can. But if you keep doing it, it's not really a goal because you don't have a date. But who knows what happens in your life. You, don't, you can't plan everything. So of course you can be flexible. That's not what I'm saying. But if you don't have this written down, it's not a goal, in my opinion. It's not a goal. It's a wish. It's a dream. It's a thought. It can be a goal, absolutely. But it doesn't have, if it doesn't have all the attributes, it won't be. Now the most important thing of these, actually is that you write them down. I mean pen and paper, I don't mean Excel or an Azure database or a Mongo or whatever. I mean write them down on paper. There's a connection between your hand and your brain that does it. If you write them down, they stick. And then what do you do when you've written them down? Anyone? Yeah? Tell other people, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's very good. Some goals you might want to keep to yourself, but if you want to share, by all means. But what I was getting at, what was that? Put them on the wall. Blue tag, sticky tape, whatever works. Put them on the wall. And put them on the wall where you are every single day. Because you keep looking at them. And it's been proven. I think it's even Harvard. I don't have to reference as such. Oh, no, I do have the reference. Sorry, I did write that in. Hey! <laughs> they did a study with MBAs. And 3% of MBAs that were um, writing down their goals were also the top earners. All right, so an MBA, that's money, whatever your goal might be. So write them down. All right, and you can do this in about 38 minutes when I'm done. Okay? <laughs> There's nothing... It's, has anyone here done a New Year's resolution? All right, get out. <laughs> no, New Year's resolutions don't work. All right? Why don't start now? Why do you have to wait for the 1st of January? Right. It's, it's kind of a, an excuse to just say, oh, I did something. It can start at any time. It doesn't matter. So why do I have goals? Again, these dudes, right? I took these guys, so that's the Berlin Wall in Germany. Not that far from here, really. And I took these little fellas there in June. To me, that was a huge thing. Because it's, it's part of my history as a Dane that the wall fell down. It's part of European history. It's part of, especially this guy's, right? Whoops, that guy. He's me. And if I hadn't had goals, that would never have happened. You don't just take, you know, five people to Germany for three weeks. So that's part of what I do to get where I want to go. Does that make sense? And you can ask questions at any time. I don't mind. I like questions because that means you're listening. Okay. If you don't ask questions, you have to put a green in there. <laughs> now you can put whatever you want. Now you've done your goals, right? So you've got a list of goals, however many you can come up with, and you keep editing them, you keep writing new ones, you keep completing them. But you, that's got to be work involved, right? You can't just start writing a goal and go, "I've got a goal." Yes, no, to the pub. You know that doesn't work that way. And you got to work on your goals all the time. It's not a I'm going to do it on Sunday, goal. You've got to be every day, even mentally, right? Of course, you can't do something every single day on every single goal. But because you look at them every day, right, because you've got them on the wall, means that they're always on your mind. So you're subconsciously, you're working on them. Sorry, I'll get rid of that. <laughs> That's mesmerizing. You see? Very, very often, this is the feeling you have. You kind of know you're on the right direction, but you're going to end up in a hole. You don't know where the, you're going, right? I'm centering myself because it's being recorded. <laughs> and and this, is, this is an important part of the journey, right? Because you don't know how the goal is going to pan out. You know how you want to go there, but the reality is that it's going to be kind of a, you know, swervy, swervy way because stuff happens, life happens, gets in the way, stuff you didn't anticipate. But if you have a goal, you can at least readjust so you know where you're headed, right? Otherwise, you're just going to get knocked off the track and go the other direction. That scares me <laughs> still. <laughs> Um, especially the whole TED thing now, talking about for like, I want to do it, but like, imagine stealing, what is it, 6,000 people or something? <sighs> yeah, okay. Um, so there's a few ways that you can begin to achieve these things. And I want to go through a few different methods or uh, methods, topics that has helped me tremendously grow, progress, whatever you want to call it, from about six years ago. So bear in mind, six years ago, I didn't do anything. 
I went to work, because that's what you did, and I went home and I played a computer game and I watched a movie or I mowed the lawn or whatever it is that society tells you you have to do, right? Um, and then I started changing. So this is a big part of um, sort of achieving your goals, in my opinion. Like, you may disagree with all these, that's fine. And please, if you do, you yell out. I like feedback. So that's one way of realizing your goals. It's, it's meeting other people. Right? And there's this old saying that you are who you associate yourself with. Right? You are essentially, actually I was talking with Steve about this on the weekend, you are like the five people closest to you. Right? So if you hang out with, sorry, losers, right? if you hang out with people that have no ambitions, that don't want to take initiative to anything, you're going to be the same way. And it might be a childhood friend you've known for 25 years, but the reality is if if you don't want to, if you want to move forward, they're holding you back, right? It's pretty brutal, I know. But I've cut off people that were negative, that kept sort of going. My other half, Fiona, she calls it the birds. The birds that come around and peck and go. Are you sure? Are you sure you want to do that? Are you sure? Are you ready? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? And they just peck at you, and they keep pecking, until suddenly you go. No, I don't. No, I don't actually think I want to. I think no, no, I want to. I don't. I'm not. I'm not going to do that. Those people should be chained up. Let's go with that. Because <laughs> how dare they tell me what to do, right? All right. So network. Start your own meetup group. You know, whatever it is, go and meet people. Go and talk to them. Find out what they what makes them tick. You don't have to talk to them forever. If it's someone that you have nothing in common with. You go, eh, okay, that was cool. Hey, see you. And you just move on, right? But get out there. I know, especially as nerds, it's not always that easy. Because you're going to go, you go, do you like Warcraft? You know? And we have that sort of little bit of a stigma to it. But just get out there. Everybody really. And you know what the easiest way is to get people to talk? Just ask them about themselves. It works every time. Oh, so what do you do? It works. People like talking about themselves. Um... This is kind of what networking feels like sometimes. Because the more you do it, the more meetups you go to, you keep intersecting with people that you met before. And then suddenly someone else that you talk to knows someone else you talk to, and they talk to each other. And, and know what happens? Suddenly opportunities come up. And you go, hey, we saw it. You do the thing with the thing. Do you want to come and talk about it? Or do you want to help us out at work? Or do you want to, you know, want to help us with this project? Or what? And I promise you, if you just start talking to people, just willy-nilly, even the conference, right? I bet you you know about 0.6% of people in this room. <laughs> just start talking to people. Say, hey, that was cool. I saw you did the thing. Or what do you do? Whatever it is, just bring it up. Opportunities will come. But then what happens <laughs> on the flip side of this is that it just keeps coming. And you've got to learn to say no. Right? If it's something you don't want to do, you've got to learn to say no. I am really shit at saying no. Like, I always say yes, and I get in trouble for it. Because what happens is that you go completely bonkers. Because everything is top priority. And you can't do it. You've got to learn to say no. And that's good, isn't it? <laughs> so you just keep saying yes, and in the end you go, yes, yeah, sure, okay, I have no idea what I'm going to do, but yay! And then you just end up looking like that, right? You're going to shut down and you just, it's going to be too much. So networking is good, but the constant traffic your way, because what you put out there comes back, I promise you, what you put out there comes right back. And if you're positive about, about things and you're excited about what people are doing and you collaborate and you communicate, it comes back. You, know, you should see my inbox. <laughs> um, another thing that most people are uncomfortable with is leverage. Anyone know what I mean when I say leverage? I'll just have a guess. There's not one definition of it, but yeah? When you have something someone else wants and they have something you want. Is that what you said? Ah, so you have a, you have a thing or a skill or a, a trait and you can use that to get others to do something you want them to do. Pretty much, right? It's, a good example, for example, is so I'm, I don't have $8 million. But if I, well, pounds, let's go pounds. But what if I found the perfect block of land or rules, you know, building site, and I was a property developer, 
and I go, all right, how do I get $8 million to buy that thing? Hey, this guy over here is filthy rich, but he doesn't have time to deal with it. What if I use his money to buy the thing and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to give you $9 million back when it's all done? It's leverage, right? Of course, you've got to do your numbers. But you're leveraging his money, he's leveraging your time and skill. It's leverage. It's usually a win-win. I hope it's a win-win. Otherwise, it's taking advantage of people. But you can leverage everything in life, and there's nothing wrong with it. People are often not very comfortable to say, hey, do you want to do the thing for me? Because I, kind of, I don't know how to do it, but you're really good at it, and then in, you know, I can give you something in exchange. People just don't like doing that. They're right, especially geeks. Especially geeks. I'm one of them, right? You know, I'm just going to have a look at Wikipedia. And you go, oh, is that how you do it? Right, right. And you do it. You try and do it yourself, right? Leverage. The, 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 uh, the sum of the parts is often greater than the whole, right? It, it, you get, all get more out of it. Something that I'm... Does that make sense, by the way? Please ask questions because you're very quiet. Still. <laughs> All right. Something that I struggle with, and I still do, um, is focus. I am not good at keeping focus. Um, I'm, especially as you saw all the things that I try and do. I, no, don't use the word try. I just caught myself. Don't say try. You either can or you can't. You, you know, it's like Yoda says, do or do not, there's no try, right? It's true. Don't say try. Don't say can't either. Um, but focus, I'm like a squirrel, like, ooh, that's shiny, and I do that thing, right? Ooh, there's an email, ooh, I'm terrible at it, but it's something I'm working on. Focus is one of the things, if you can focus on a task, and I know people that are very good at it, also at this conference, tall, shiny guy, if you haven't met him, very good at focus, like, you talk to him in the morning and the afternoon, you go, and he says, oh, I just did the thing, and you go, what? I had lunch. You know, because the focus is just, push, but I'm not very good at it. But if you can keep focus, that is a huge upskill. Yeah. Why do you think you need focus? Why do you need focus? Yeah, because if it works for you, then um, Whoa. you're not doing the same, right? No, no, no. So when you say works for me, is that based on all the shit that I put on the thing? Yeah, okay. <laughs> that just means I work way too many hours. Um, but it, no, you're right. The, of course I have focus in, in moments, right? There, there's always, especially with something like deadlines, like, oh, like doing a talk like this, that's a deadline. You've got to get it done. Right? But there are things like the book I'm writing, oh, I just want to finish my pre site course first. So I just pushed the book out and it gave myself another three months. Um, but the focus to me is often because I have the B&B and I have the kids and I, have, and I just struggle finding even just 20 minutes in one task. Yeah. How do you, how do you learn focus? There's certain techniques. Um, there's some really good music by Carl Franklin that's out in the booth, Dudley Rocks, if you haven't heard it. It's called Music to Code By. Um, and it's based around uh, certain 60 to 80 beats per minute or something. There's a, there's, he's done a lot of research about it. But listening to that kind of gets you in the groove. So I've using, I'm using music a lot. Um, music soundtracks. Like I started listening to the Interstellar soundtrack. Have you heard that? It's, it's very sort of ominous, weird, futuristic music, but it works. It just kind of gets me away. Um, the Pomodoro technique, which I'm not too familiar with, but essentially you have a little clock and you set it for 25 minutes and you do that task for 25 minutes. And you kind of like, I don't know, what do you, if you get interrupted, I guess you shoot them. I'm not sure, but <laughs> you, you keep doing that task, right, for 25 minutes. Come hell or high water, that task. So there are, there are techniques that you can certainly implement, and it's all about routine as well. I should probably stop doing some of the things some of the time, to be honest, rather than doing everything all the time, because it, it doesn't benefit me. But you know, I just want to kind of put it out there that, yeah, I do lots of stuff, but it doesn't mean that I can do it all perfectly. That's not how it works. <clears throat> Anyone else? No? Surround yourself with experts, right? Because you cannot be good at everything. I hate house cleaning. I just, I, yeah, mm. And my other half, Fiona, she hates it even more. Plus, she's asthmatic, so she can't do it, she says. Um, so we have a housekeeper. We have a professional to do it for us, because they do a good job. And they do it when we tell them to. It's like using an accountant. Right? Don't try and do it all yourself, because you go mad. 
it, so, you know, whatever it is that your field is, make sure there's experts there. And you go, oh, yeah, but they cost money. Hmm. Yeah, but what happens if you don't pay them? You get stuck with it, right? And the time that they spent, say you pay $200, 200 pounds, whatever, for an accountant, hopefully that frees you up to make 300 pounds. Right? That's the idea. So that your time is spent on being focused, <laughs> you know, on doing the stuff that you're good at. Experts are key. It's like having a personal trainer. There's a reason you have a personal trainer, because if he wasn't there or she wasn't there, you wouldn't do it, right? You'd get fat. <laughs> um, I don't have a personal trainer. Um, <laughs> experts. We can't all be as smart as this dude, right? He is smiling. <laughs> we need experts. It's really important that you have experts in your life because you will go mad if you don't. Um, this one I'm particularly good at. Persistence. As it says, the fact of continuing, continuing in an optional course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition. The birds. That's one of them, right? You've got to kind of shoot the birds. You've got to get rid of them. Persistence is not easy. Persistence is when everything seems to fail and you go, I'm still going to do it. And you do it. Like, I'm not saying, you know, follow the GPS off a cliff. That's not persistence. That's just stupidity, right? I'm talking about following that goal and achieving it and making sure that it happens despite what everybody else says. Because if you do all the stuff that I'm kind of preaching, <laughs> no, that I'm talking about, you're going to end up in the 2% of the population that does. Right? The other 98% doesn't, and they will try and tell you that you're an idiot for doing it. It's knowing when to stop. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There, yes. There, I, was, I started writing a book for one of the big publishers. And my background, well, my MVP was originally in Windows phone development. I know, I'm that guy. And, uh, and I'm, I, still, I still have a Windows phone, right? I still have them. I think I have all of them in Australia. And I started writing a book about mobile development with Windows 10. And I wrote three chapters, as you're supposed to do within a certain date and whatnot. And I got to a point where I was like, this is stupid. Why am I writing this? I'm spending a lot of time. Like, you, we're talking a 450-page book, right? And you probably, what, spend 10 hours per page all up? It's an ama amazing amount of time. So I went, no, I'm not doing it. So I wrote, I wasn't being nasty. I said, it's about saying no, right? I said, no, this is silly. It's not worth my time. It's not worth any effort whatsoever. It's not going to benefit me in any way. So yeah, there's absolutely a time where you go, no. Nah. But persistence is critical, to, especially to achieving goals. Because there will be times where you go, can't do it. It's not going to happen. But you can. You can absolutely do it. Questions? Anyone? Jeez, you're quiet. Yes, down the back. Can you tell more about networking? Yeah, sure. So what, what do you want to know? Mm-hmm. Yep. So, so you're asking, how do you take the first step? How do you know what the person next to you, in front of you... It, I think I know what you're saying. So the question, I think, let me paraphrase, is that when you start talking to a person you've never met before and 
how do you gauge the level of conversation that you need to start at? Is that right? So how do you gain experience to gauge the level of, of technical skill, I guess, when you talk to people? Um, it's, that's a kind of interesting question because I don't think it matters. If, if I stand next to, to this gentleman here in the coffee queue, right, I go, oh, hi, how are you going? I'm Lars. Instantly you're introduced, right? And, you, and I just go, oh, so what do you, what company do you work for? You don't have to start with saying, hey, do you do the handlebar JS JavaScript on the thing? You, know, you don't have to start right there. You can sort of have a much higher level because very often when you say, hey, where do you work? People go, oh, I work at the you know, X, y, X, Y, Z, Z bank or something. And they go, oh, right, are you a developer? And they it automatically sort of just ask broad questions. And it might be that they go, why, why are you talking to me? And they go, oh, okay, you just move on, right? You can't control what people think about you. But the chances are that if they're in the same headspace as you are, trying to actually connect with people and meet them and explore and whatnot, they'll be very open to talking to people. Most people have no problem replying, talking back. It's that first step of saying, hey, how you going? You know, that's the hard part for some reason. I've always found it very easy. <laughs> um, but, but I know it is. You, you need that first interaction. I don't know who that person is. Why would they talk to me? You have that barrier. So I don't think you need to worry too much about the skill level. I think that will come naturally. And if it is that you suddenly find yourself talking to Douglas Crockford about JavaScript, well, I'll just back away, right? You know, <laughs> actually, he's very nice to talk to. Um, so so I, does that answer your question in terms of networking? It's much more about this sort of almost shotgun approach initially, going, who, who are all these people? Who can I talk to? And so what if you get stuck for 20 minutes talking to someone? You know, you've had that experience. Might be something comes of it, maybe not. But you've got to talk to people. <laughs> like, all of the work I get as a freelancer, all of it has come through word of mouth. I'm not kidding. Every single project has been through someone I know or someone I've met or someone that heard about me. All of it. So I'm not saying you should be a freelancer or anything, because that's freaking scary. Um, but you, it, if you don't talk to people... All of this is going to be so much harder. So much harder. Anyone else about anything? Oh. Yeah, go on. Yep. Uh, so have, you ever set your, have you ever failed to meet the goal? Absolutely. And what did you do to you persist? Uh, so let's say you had a time barrier mm -hmm. and you failed to do it within a certain time. Yep. Did you say, right, I'll just extend the time or did you just drop it? Or what? So I can go back to the book example because I had a goal. I always wanted to write a book. Because I wanted the experience of... I've always been quite impressed with people that write these thick books. Like, how the hell do you do that? Like, where do you get all those words from, right? So I thought, all right, I want to do it. So I started it, and that's when I essentially quit the goal. Like I said, I, I'm not doing this. I've, I've reached as far as I'm going to go, and it's not worth my time. What I did, though, was I kind of rewrote the goal. And I got introduced to Sync Fusion and their e-books which are 100 pages and much more sort of high-level, lighter reading. I went, all right, I can do that. So that's what I'm doing now. So, but if you, you can absolutely cancel goals, but it's got to be a conscious decision, not a I'd rather play Xbox decision, right? It's got to be because it, that is not worth my time. But you're in charge of that. That's the power you have. That's the empowerment to lead the life that you want to lead, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah? Um, I want to touch on something that most people always are afraid to ask about. Yeah, we're good. Income, right? Because we don't like talking about money. We don't ask people what they earn. We don't, you know, we don't like it, right? And I think it's an important part of the equation of because we all like money, right? Even if we're not a capitalist or whatever, we still need money to pay our bills and buy food and buy new iPhones and whatever else we buy, right? Money is a part of it. And there's no way I could be a member of three car clubs. And we, we actually have 17 cars right now. <laughs> because we do cars, like cars. Um, they're not all drivable. 
There's four of them that kind of don't have engines. Um, but there's two main ways of earning an income. Does anyone know where they are? Yes. Active and passive. Exactly. So what's an active income? Someone else. <laughs> Sorry? A job. Yep. That's a general term, a job. Yeah. It's trading time for money, right? So it doesn't have to be a job, jobs as such, but you're absolutely right. I have some time, I sell it to you, and I actively get paid because I did those hours, I did the thing. Right? When I stop giving the time, I stop making money. That's an active income. Does anyone want to guess what a passive income is then? <laughs> Investment, yeah, could be. Plural site. It's when you stop doing the thing, you still get paid. Right? We like that. Because it's like, oh, I did the thing. I'm going to go on a holiday. I'm still getting paid. You know? That's passive income. And those two are really important to identify. Because active income, you might earn a really good salary, but when it goes, it goes. It's gone. Right? You don't, there's nothing else. So a good example of passive income, as Chris has just said before, Pluralsight. For me, anyway. So Pluralsight... You do a course, you get paid to complete the course, then you get a commission based on the number of hours out of the total hours watched that your course are responsible for. Right? So the better the platform does, the better. The more hours I get, the more money I earn. But I can work on the next course while the other eight or nine or whatever I have still tick along, right? It's compounding. That's passive income. Any other good examples? That was investment, that was a good one. Sorry? Pension? Okay, we should talk more. Uh, <laughs> Are you talking about government pension? I'm not sure what the system is like in Britain, but I've never heard pension being a good idea. <laughs> um, it, it, is, it is a form of income after you start working, sure. Um, but it, it doesn't really compound, and it will stop eventually. And to be honest, I don't know, but in Australia, when I'm 70 or whatever, I, there's not going to be a pension. There's too few people to pay for it. I don't think there's going to be any pension. It's going to be you're on your own. So that's enough. But it's not completely wrong. You're not completely wrong. I just kind of disagree. <laughs> um, anyone else? Rental, Rental properties, yep. Those are really hard because you need quite a large margin to get in, but they're really good if you do get into it, rental properties. Um, mostly the market does not drop, <laughs> over time at least. But passive income, it's it's really important part of your safety net. If you think there's something called a secure job, no, it doesn't exist. All right. This is again what society tells us. It's what my parents told me, get a good secure job. Right. My brother's been in a secure job. Well, he's been in several, actually. <laughs> um, it, it doesn't exist. It just as easily goes away as if you were not. I mean, I'm not saying don't get a job. That's not what I'm saying. You've got to do what's right for you. But I'm just saying that's not a safety net, having a job. All right. Any other questions? No? All right. And it's your turn. All right. You you got to get Darth Vader out of your life. You got to get the the magic force that stops you from doing what you're doing out of your life. And I think good's first step is write a goal. If you don't have goals, if you do have goals, look at them again, review them, make sure you're on track. But if you get anything out of this session that I can pass on that make a huge difference to me, it's goals. And it might sound a bit wanky but it works, and write it down. Not in Excel. <laughs> it is really important. Goals is the one thing that will change everything for you, and you might not believe me right now, but it will. Um, and then when you've done your first goal, you can email me, and I'll print you out a certificate. How about that? <laughs> that's, that's my message to you. Anyone want to ask anything? You can come on up, come up and ask afterwards as well if you don't want to ask in a public forum. Yeah, um, yep. You said that when you had your low point, um, that your language really died. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So the initial goals. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. So the question is what that, that flame I was talking about, that's the best way I can describe it anyway. When it went away, is that the question? What, what were the goals of the time? Well, it was, I was pretty young. I, was, I moved away from home when I was 17. Not because I didn't like my parents, but I moved to Canada. And I just wanted to explore. And I just, that flame kind of kept me going for quite a while, which is why I ended up here in Australia, because I was 23 when I moved to Australia from Denmark. And that's when I went to uni, and the whole thing just started just slowly dying out. And I lost, uh, I lost that passion of traveling. Um, well, that's not completely true, but I lost the passion of exploring um, travel as part of my lifestyle. I still went on holidays and whatnot. And I think that flame was probably still there, but it was being suppressed, something shocking, because there were all these stigmas of society that said, hey, you know what, you've you got to get a really good car. Because if you get a really good car, you're going to get respect from that guy over there, and you're going to look awesome, right? There's all these monikers that we have around what society tells us. And it just wasn't me. I didn't give a shit what they thought of my car. <laughs> Especially not now. I have a 1985 BMW, you know? It's <laughs> and I think, I think it's probably the goals I had were not defined. But I wasn't pursuing anything other than kind of what was delivered to me. Someone else was controlling what, where I was going. Anyone else? Yeah? Six years ago, the first goal. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't overnight, obviously. It took me about a year to actually get into that mindset. Um, I think the first goal was to, to get out of a rental from memory. I th that was certainly one of them. That I was, I kept, so I had a house that we bought, and then I went into a rental, into a rental. And I was just sick of sort of opening the window and go, whoosh, throwing money out. So that was a big part for me because I, I felt like I'm not going anywhere. I wasn't investing. I wasn't doing something. I think that was it. There was also a couple around personal development, um, but they're a bit more private, to be honest. <laughs> I was a question down the back. Yeah. The experts, is that what you're saying? No, the birds. Oh, the birds, sorry, yeah. Oh, yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. How do you deal with that bird? That's a good question. You need help. It's very, very rare that you can... No, seriously. <laughs> I, I don't mean that kind of help. Um... It's good to have someone to hold you accountable in that, in that regard because if you constantly say to yourself, no, I can't do it, if you have someone that keeps saying, no, you can do it and you're going to do it and you're going to do it by that date and I'm going to kick you up the backside until you do it, right? You can pay me to do that. I'll be happy to do it. Um, you need someone else to help you with that. I don't, that's, you can do it on your own, but very rare. You need to kind of like let it out and then, have someone on the inside that knows kind of what you're going through. I don't think that's... I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't deal with that myself. A mental, personal trainer. Yeah, that's good. That's a good analogy, actually. Yeah, I like that. Um, and it could be, like, it could be a family member or it could be your best friend. It could be your boss. Um, it could be someone completely from the outside that you find in a user group, that you network with, whoever. Whoever you can trust and you feel is going to not just hold your hand but actually going to push you to do more. Because I think we all have that little bird that sits and goes, hey, you know what? I don't think I'm going to good, good enough. No. Um, I'm telling you, the first time you speak in an event when there's like 600 people in front of you, there's a lot of birds. <laughs> there's a lot of birds. It's kind of like how you deal with it. Anyone else? Steve? Steve-o? So have I ever had to deal with imposter tr syndrome? Um, how do I explain imposter syndrome? I guess it's kind of like, why, would I, why do I think I'm good enough to do that when you set a goal? Because um, I was saying you need goals that are big enough so that you push yourself. And that, what Steve's just saying, is a huge part of it. Because you automatically go, 
I saw that dude up on stage doing it. Well, I can't do that. Why would I want to do that? You know, I, and how I deal with it? Because mm, it comes, that's pretty natural to have imposter syndrome. It's good. I'm not sure how I deal with it. I'll probably, I'll probably talk to someone as well. Um, and I'll probably try and try. I said, try again. God damn it. I will go to the first step of the goal. And then because I can achieve that bit, I might get enough confidence to... So not focus on the end goal necessarily. Um, Rob Connery that's here as a speaker, if you've heard of Rob, he's just written a, a whole book, ebook on imposter syndrome. And it's unbelievably good. Because um, he's been dealing with it a lot. I think he's also got a talk on it. Not here, but in, in somewhere. Uh, but imposter syndrome, that's a good one. That's certainly something that people struggle with because it's, it's pretty natural. <laughs> Anyone else? Ooh, we got hands now. Yay. Yes. Oh, there's a good one. How do I make sure I got enough family time? Essentially almost what you're saying, right? Yeah. It's especially hard when you're not in a in a nine to five job. Because I'm my commute in the morning is about twenty seven seconds. And it makes it really easy, right? I work from home. To go and just, I'm just going to do another hour. I'm just going, and it makes it really easy to play with Christian on the floor and just check your emails, right? And I get in trouble for that, and rightly so. So how do I balance it? I try and make very, very specific time available, especially for Christian. Like kind of Fiona kind of gets it, um, although she gets annoyed as well. When are you stopping? When are you quitting? Arr. And it's again, it's especially if you're using techniques that we're talking about, but the Pomodoro, keeping focus on something. If you say, oh, I'm going to do three of those and then quit and then stop, you've got to have some sort of plan. Um, uh, with me, with Christians, kind of like when he's awake, I play with him. Or, you know, not throughout the day, someone else is looking after him. Um, but if at night, you know, if he's there, I'm there as well. Um, the 11 year old is a little bit trickier. Because he, he's got to the stage now where he says, well, you work all the time anyway. You know, so <laughs> so it, it's hard finding the balance. It is really not easy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the question is, do I have... Um, shorter term goals, is that what you're saying? Yeah, are you making new ones all the time? Am I making new ones all the time? Um, I wouldn't say all the time, but I'm not hesitant to create a new one. If there's something I go, oh, yeah. And I keep prioritizing them as well. Like there are some things that really are on the back burner because you just can't do everything. But I had a goal last year of I wanted to be paid to speak, right? Because these conferences here, we don't get paid as speakers, right? They, they pay for our flights and accommodation, but especially as a freelancer, I'm here on my own time, right? So I had this goal of saying, well, by the end of 2016, I want to be paid to speak. I want to have, I didn't care what it was, like, you know, $3, yay. But I just want to have someone appreciate that I'm there and I'm, you know, sharing knowledge that I've acquired over a long period of time, whatever, whatever, and there's a fee involved because it was important to me to have that acknowledgement that I was, my time there was valuable, and I did it. I was in Poland for a week in December. And they even found me. Again, it was networking. I was putting it out there, you know. Hey! And they found me. So it's smaller goals, yeah. Um, and I, I regularly cross them off too as well. Um, with the car business, I had one where I just wanted to buy a car and sell it for double what I bought it for. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be, but I've never done that. And we did that last week. So I wasn't even there. <laughs> I was here. Um, so yeah, there's lots of goals that you can set. And they, they have to be ambitious, but they don't have to be big. So, yeah, I think, last one. Yeah, I deliberately didn't put anything up burning out into the slide deck because it's almost a talk in itself, at least like 20, 25 minutes, in my opinion. Burning out is really quite a delicate topic um, because it hits people in different ways. Um, I can be completely flat out for six weeks and then have a week off. It's not because I'm burned out, it's just because I need a break. But some people might do that for six weeks and then be burned out, right? It's, it's, it's not, I'm not comfortable talking about it in too, you know, too, um, what do you call it, too strict terms. 
I guess. But it is a, it is a problem. Because the more you take on, the more you say yes, the more you have to do, and you just don't have any time to take care of yourself. I should exercise more, for example, right? And I don't. So there's always something. Right, I think we're kind of out of time because um, it's 3 o'clock. I can take one more if you want. If people, yeah, because I know there was a few hands. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's a very good question. If you have a two-year goal, for example, how do you know that you're progressing? How do you work on it all the time? You need to have as, ma as many little milestones as you possibly can. Like, because it's kind of like, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? But you can see the progress, and that motivates you as well. But if you just have, you know, say, in five years I want to talk, I'll be a keynote speaker at Ignite, uh, Build, sorry. Like, where are the steps, you know? It's, uh, you might have the step, Christos, I don't know. You didn't kind of cheat. But you need to have that measurable, again, the smart goals, you need to be able to measure where you're at. Um, and it's not easy. I'm not saying any of this is easy. <laughs> if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Yeah? All right. That's, but come up afterwards if you want. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.